And as Libby mentioned, I am, a, besides a cardiologist at UCSF, I'm editor for the last nine years at JAMA Internal Medicine. So I thought I could bring a perspective on journals and how journals play a role in transforming healthcare. And uh, like uh, Libby, I thought I would start out with, by telling you how I got um, to what my interests are currently. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn, as I say, before it was hip. And uh, <laughs> the part of Brooklyn I grew up in has not changed very much. It's still not very hip. Um, both of my parents actually um, did not complete high school. Uh, they grew up during the Depression. You know, we grew up fairly modestly, and so I was always taught, you know, to reuse and recycle and and not waste things. And I think that kind of upbringing had a big influence on how I feel now and how I see what we're doing in healthcare. Um, so I was able. To, I worked my way at that time, it was a lot easier, through college and medical school because costs were lower and loans and scholarships were generous. Um, I went to medical school at the University of Pennsylvania where I was very fortunate um, to work with John Eisenberg, who at that time, I think he was working on diagnosis-related groups um, for, with Blue Cross, but I worked with him on uh, some research projects. He, I was, as I said, a second-year medical student or first year, and he was sending, this was before email, if you can remember back that far. So he would send little notes to the house staff every day about their test ordering. And he was trying to get them to stop ordering daily chemistries on the inpatients. And so he sent them notes that kind of asked, well, what did you learn from these tests? And how did it change your management? And you know, were your patients better off? And then he was a good academic and collected the data, and he found that these little notes actually had no impact on house staff ordering behavior. <laughs> but it did have a big impact on me, because I thought, wow, I had just assumed that everything the house staff did, which to me were kind of next to God in terms of what they knew, I'd assumed that everything we were doing in healthcare was because there was a good reason and we it was going to improve patient outcomes. And that really got me thinking early on in my career that maybe that wasn't the case. And it got me very interested in looking at why we do have such an expensive healthcare system, yet at, at that time it was about 35, 40 million Americans don't have health insurance. Our indicators aren't as good as countries that spend a lot less. And I had the opportunity to go to uh, Great Britain, actually, while I was in medical school, Penn has a Toron Fellowship. So I spent a year studying health policy at the London School of Economics, which was very interesting, both for studying health policy, but also because at that time, if you were a student, you got an NHS card. So I actually um, got to experience the National Health Service from the inside. And I also did some medical rotations with um, doctors and GPs all throughout Great Britain to actually see how the NHS worked. And then um, in my sort of mid-career, about 14 years ago, I went to Washington for a year and worked as a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow. I worked in the uh, office of Senator Hatch, who at that time was chairing judiciary, to learn about more uh, sort of what was going on in congressional health policy. And all the time, you know, I'm thinking when I was in academics in Congress, what's the best way to really try to transform health policy? and try to improve our healthcare system and work on that issue that I think is so important. Why do we spend so much, much, so much and get, I think, a very poor return on our investment? And so um, I went back to UCSF and, and then had the opportunity to leave the journal. I think we saw um, some of this, that, and I think we already know, that we spend far more in the US on healthcare than anywhere else in the world. I remember at the time that I was going um, to London to study at LSE, which was 1980, we were at 9% of GDP on healthcare. And people were saying, when we get to double digits of G GDP on healthcare, that's going to be the watershed moment and things will really change in this country. <laughs> well, as you know, we're way past that. We're at 17%. The projections are that we will get to 20% in the next decade. And I think we still have a lot of even bigger problems to tackle in healthcare. Um, this um, just shows the historical data. 
and that there has been a disturbing trend. I think we'll hear more about drug pricing maybe in the um, next part of the panel. But for a lot of reasons, prices are again going up. And as Andy alluded to, there's sort of no, certainly no bipartisan consensus on the best way to approach this and to really improve our healthcare system. So as I said, um, although I do continue to see patients um, every day or weekly in my uh, cardiology role, I actually went into cardiology probably for different reasons than most cardiologists. I was very interested in the clinical part of cardiology, but I also knew that cardiology was a very high-tech specialty. And I, I had early on thought that technology and the way we use technology was a big part of why we're spending so much money on healthcare. And so I went into um, cardiology partly with the idea of looking at technology assessment from the inside. And so um, I'll sort of transition now over to some of the things that we've done at JAMA Internal Medicine which, and why, uh, what I see as the issues and problems. So this actually, we have a series called uh, Less is More that started around 2009 when the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force issued that mammography declaration that said women between ages 40 and 50 uh, should not or yeah, should not routinely get mammography because the harms outweighed the benefit. And you probably know that there was a big outcry. It was received very negatively. And one of the other... Um, editors, Deborah Grady and I, were kind of talking about why was it received so negatively, you know, and we thought, well, probably the message that there was more harm than good coming out of this was not clearly understood or clearly given. And we started thinking, you know, that's true for a lot of medical care. We thought a fair amount these days where actually there isn't a known benefit. And as I said, that was something I had been thinking about really since medical school. But I think we have, and I you know, live in Silicon Valley, I think the home of high tech, and certainly you know, technology can be great, but just because it's a new technology doesn't mean it's great. I think you still have to show that you're better than the old technology and that you're better than a low tech or you know, less technical solution in healthcare I'm talking about. I think there's an attitude currently that getting a medical test can't hurt, you know, I often have patients ask me for um, medical testing and you know, say, well, Dr. Redberg, you know, my insurance will cover it. And I, I don't think, you know, that's not the issue. It's the, to me, the issue is, are you going to be better off with this test? And if not, why get it? Because any kind of, even a diagnostic test and certainly procedures have downsides and harms. And so kind of we went from there um, to thinking that we really wanted to emphasize that medical care needs to be the right test and the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. And that if a test or a treatment has no known benefit, then no risk is acceptable. And with that, um, we wrote this editorial of Deborah Grady and I and launched the Less is More series to kind of talk about how there are areas where less health care can, can be better for you with the areas that have more harm than benefit. And we decided not to include cost at all in this series. We really just wanted to focus on things that have no benefit because we felt like the public was not aware of this. And so I think, and what I wanted to talk about is I think journals and we all have a role in sort of increasing awareness of what are we spending our money on because certainly I don't think we can solve the problems of access without solving the problem of you know, increasing percent of GDP on healthcare with more and more out-of-pocket costs and not great health outcomes, certainly not well distributed in the United States. So we launched this series and that was uh, seven years ago and we have gotten um, more and more and more articles with different examples. And so I just wanted to talk about a few of them that um, I'm particularly proud of, I would say, because they, I think, help to make some things better or launch series or other things. And, and so the first one is one um, that's particularly dear to me because, you know, Libby Rosenthal, and I would say, 
I wanted to be a New York Times reporter before I <laughs> wanted to be a doc. I wanted to be a New York Times reporter, but when someone told me, this was back in high school, when I was on my high school paper in Brooklyn, that I would probably never get to, never get to the New York Times, and certainly you couldn't start there, that I would have to start at a small town paper somewhere where I didn't know. I kind of re reassessed and thought, and I don't regret it, <laughs> that medicine would be a great career. But at any rate, so I followed Libby's work because she was covering healthcare costs at this time for the New York Times. And we had an article on uh, the price of, for hip replacements. And it was a pretty interesting, it was a kind of secret shopper study where this uh, student, who was also named Rosenthal, but I don't think any relation. No, no relation. <laughs> yeah. um, but she was a college student and she called 100 hospitals, two in each state, and said that her grandmother needed hip surgery and needed to pay out of pocket or had to pay a percentage and so wanted to know the cost. And you probably won't be surprised to know that it was very hard to get any information on what the cost would be for hip replacement for her grandmother. And that the, the figures she did get varied widely. And so I think we had just written an article sort of like that. And so I, and I'm sure you'd see, sent her the article and you wrote this great blog and then you said at the um, New York Times Health Conference that Libby was at at UCSF, that this blog, I think, got, and I showed 512 comments there on the article, which was, and came in very quickly, and I believe launched, this is what you said, yeah, the Paying Till It Hurts series. So we were very excited to have this small role. And, and as I said, and I do think, uh, it's important to get information out there, and I think medical journals, particularly when you know, we get this uh, pickup in a high-profile New York Times article, um, is a very good way to educate patients. Um, I do think, as I said, I spent some time uh, working in Congress, mostly from my point of view, trying to see where I could be most effective in trying to reform the healthcare system. I would say after you know, my time there and, and continuing, and I still do some congressional advisory work, but it's very hard to achieve a lot of change. There are a lot of fixed entrenched interests, and, and so I think no matter which way we go forward, and as Andy said, we really need consensus among the public, and I think a great way to educate the public is uh, medical journals, certainly along with uh, media. So just to give a few other examples, quickly um, on w ways that I think the public can be more informed and ideas um, all from GEM Internal Medicine. We, we, this was also in the Less is More series. This was from a hospital, Christiana Hospital, I think, where as part of the Choosing Wisely program, and how many of you are familiar with Choosing Wisely? Looks like a good number. It was the, uh, a program that's, I, I, promoted by congressional societies to come up with things that um, patients should talk to their doctors before proceeding. The idea was to have these lists of things that maybe weren't very helpful for medical care. And so one of the things on this list had to do with telemetry. So this hospital um, found that they could, and I think they cut the number of patients on telemetry by about 90% just by reducing the indications. And then they monitored them, and, and we published their findings, and they basically found that there were um, very few changes in patient management. Remember, I think is a good metric, you know, is this test actually going to make patients better off? And that life-threatening life arrhythmias were very rare, and so that they were able to reduce the telemetry usage. And for those of you who work or run hospitals, you know telemetries are a big backup because we often can't transfer patients out of the ICU because there's no telemetry beds and you know it just creates backups all the way through and it turned out that you could actually cut your telemetry use quite a bit and patients would be just as well off. Um, another example and as I said I'm particularly interested in my own research is on medical device regulation and the quality and quantity of evidence that is available to prove safety and effectiveness before we approve medical devices. And as I said, cardiology and actually orthopedics, so we're well represented here, are responsible for most of medical devices. And 
I think there's a big issue that a lot of devices are getting on the market without um, adequate evidence or without any evidence of safety and effectiveness. So this was an article also that ran in the Less Is More series. It looked at a um, device, I'll just say it was for atrial fibrillation. So you know, atrial fibrillation is an increasingly common arrhythmia. And the concern with atrial fibrillation is that you'll have a stroke. And it's thought that the particular part of the left atrium, the appendage, might be where the stroke came from, and that if you were able to close off the appendage, that you wouldn't get a clot there and therefore wouldn't have a stroke when you had atrial fibrillation. So that's the idea. Um, this device, and that's a picture of it, is actually a suture that goes around the left atrial appendage. So it has to, you have to have it inserted through a catheter that gets looped into your heart and then it has to be um, closed off around the appendage. So this went through the FDA through a 510K, which means that it has to be substantially equivalent to a device already on the market. I will say the IOM report in 2011 recommended the FDA get rid of the 510K pathway because it could not assure safety and effectiveness because that's not a criteria for 510K. The criteria is just that you're similar to something that's already on the market, but that's something on the market to not have to show safety and effectiveness. This device got on the market as being substantially equivalent to an abdominal suture used for soft tissue approximation for abdominal closures. Um, the, but it was marketed and only used off-label for in the heart, which was clearly a different and different risk. And there were no clinical studies at the time it got on the market. Um, this study that we published was a, just a review, and as you can see, I don't know if I have a pointer, but basically there were some significant risks that were uncovered in this review through a review of the adverse event database. And one of the other issues that I don't have time to go into is that our adverse event reporting is very low, and so it's estimated only a few percent of adverse events actually get reported. But they did find that 2.3% of people who got this suture closure needed urgent surgery, and there was one death. And there was no um, studies that looked at safety and effectiveness. So I would say um, there were issues uh, with this, I think, or how could you give a 510K clearance? First of all, this is a high-risk device, and the 510K pathway is not intended for high-risk devices. Secondly, it was considered substantially equivalent to something that was never, it was an abdominal suture, so a very different risk situation to be used in the heart, and that the safety and efficacy hadn't been used. After the study was published, um, the, there was now, there's a registry, I think the company is doing a trial, although the device does remain on the market and is used commonly. I'll go maybe very quickly or, the inferior vena cava filter was just another example. Um, the inferior vena cava is a filter you can put inside the inferior vena cava because if you get a blood clot in your leg, like on long plane trips or something, and you can't take a blood thinner, it might go to your heart. And so the idea was it would prevent blood clots from going to your heart. So as part of, again, as the Less Is More series, this is a device that has very little or no data of safety. And if that it actually reduces the complication it's supposed to reduce, or that patients are better off. This review found about half of these filters that were placed were inappropriate. Um, this was another article that showed that there was a very high fracture rate and complications. So again, you had the combination of little or no benefit and significant complications. Um, and I just wrote this editorial suggesting there was um, a lack of evidence and harm and that we needed to be more cautious with our use of IVC filters. The day we published this study, the FDA, and this is why I'm saying I think medical journals can have some impact, the FDA issued a warning on the um, IVC filters. The warning was really just reminding doctors that we need to remove filters because they're supposed to be retrievable. I'm going to skip the sugar story because I'm talk too much about everything else, and just go, well, I'll say, the sugar, well, no, I'll skip it. So the, just to wrap up, I think that in order to really transform healthcare and start to address 
why we have such an expensive healthcare system that I think by its nature makes it inaccessible because we clearly can't afford this kind of um, healthcare and we're not getting a good return. I, to me, what makes the most sense is to start with going after waste. That seems like the low hanging fruit. You know, procedures that have more harm than good is not things that I think we need to be doing. People, I think um, Jim mentioned end of life care. I mean, you know, the kind of ends of life care where people didn't want it and are not happy with it, yet costs a lot of money, is probably not a good use of our healthcare dollars. So I, I just think I could go on for a long time, but I won't. So there are a lot of examples of overuse, um, inefficiency, and as one of the previous speakers mentioned, we pay much higher prices for that in this country than anywhere else. So I think by starting to really address overuse and waste and that we need to all come together to, to do this, when I say all, I mean you know, patients, um, providers, payers, hospital systems, uh, that we can then work on improving quality and lowering overall costs, and that will enable increased access. Thank you.